So Jamie, I've heard you've done about a thousand central lines, is that true? Yes, Mike. It seems to me like there's probably four roadblocks that can really get you into trouble when you're trying to throw in a line. What do you think? That's true. And you know, those roadblocks can really be a hassle sometimes. Let's see what we can do to try to ease some of that. Yeah, let's make it easy for everybody. All right, so roadblock number one is optimal patient positioning. Now we're going to do an IJ technique and Anton was kind enough to uh, be our model here. So first off, we'll talk about how the temptation is to get the patient to flex their neck or rotate their neck all the way to the left to give you as much real estate to work with when you're doing your central line insertion. But when you do that, you run the risk of, in, of getting a carotid puncture. And the reason why that is, is because that IJ gets pulled on top of the carotid. So what I do is before I do get sterile, before I do anything, I put the probe on the neck, and as Jamie will demonstrate here, I find the IJ and the carotid, and you can see the IJ is nice and relatively lateral to the carotid. And also point out now that don't forget the value of a good Trendelenburg, and if the patient's able to, a good Valsalva maneuver to get that IJ as nice and plump as possible. But you can see though, this is the view with Anton looking straight up, and as he rotates his neck slowly to the left, that IJ is being pulled on top of the carotid. And now, if you were to go and in advance your needle and try to get flashback, you run the risk of going through and through the IJ into the carotid and get a arterial puncture. So before, that's why, back before you get prepped, before you decide on the IJ site, site, make sure you find that optimal positioning where the IJ is nice and lateral. Also observe how much the track of the IJ changes over the course of its length. Here close to the clavicle, we're actually quite lateral and could easily do it uh, under real-time ultrasound guidance. And then as I come up the neck, the IJ is coursing over the carotid. So not only does the position change with rotation, but also the length of the neck will change considerably. Totally. So choose a good target. But if you find that no matter what you're doing, that IJ is still sitting on top of the carotid, at that point, what else can we try, Jamie? Well, I like to use something called the posterior approach, which has been nicely described in Robertson Hedges. And um, basically what it is, is using a needle and using an ultrasound probe with in-plane technique so that you come posterior to the sternocleidomastoid muscle, but above the carotid artery. And what that does is, allows you to avoid carotid puncture. It also frees up some real estate on the neck because somebody has a short fat neck that you're having difficulty getting the needle on top of the where you want to go. And um, it also has the advantage of preventing the uh, compression of the IJ to compress and go through the posterior wall into the carotid. Okay, perfect. So uh, roadblock number one is optimal patient positioning and making sure that that IJ is as far away from the carotid as possible to minimize the risk of a carotid puncture. All right, so roadblock number two. There's nothing worse when you've advanced your needle, you've gotten flashback, you know you're in the vein, but then you go to advance your wire and you can't advance it, you check your placement and you're no longer in the vessel. So you've lost placement of your, of your needle. So there's a few reasons for that and we'll break down one of the few ways you can make this a lot easier for you. So firstly, if you're going to use the um, large steel introduced needle, which we'll talk about first, make sure you take it out of the kit and make sure it's not too snug on the syringe. You want to make it, you want to make it tight, but not too tight. Because if it's too tight, after you get flashback, you're trying to take off the syringe, you're moving the needle around, and you've lost your position of the needle. So when you put it on, put it on very gently. Next thing, before you even advance the needle, make sure your, your wire, uh, you've checked your wire, the J-tip's working okay, you got the introducer uh, uh, ready to go, and it's on the patient's chest, you know exactly where it is, so you're not looking around for that once you get flashback. The last thing to do, when you, get, when you do get flashback, make sure your left hand is supporting that needle um, and is secured to the patient. So if the patient is to move while that syringe is deta uh, detached and you're getting the wire, that needle is moving with the patient rather than the needle moving in the vessel. But if you're doing that and you're still finding you're just not able to get that wire into the vessel and you're losing your position of the needle, then Jamie, what can we try then? Well, Mike, I'm a big proponent of using the angiocath for vascular access. And uh, there's a few reasons for that. Um, I also prefer using the non-vented syringe. I just feel it gives a better feel for what's happening. Um, but both are totally viable. Um, in bariatric patients, especially, when you move the ultrasound probe and you get your flash pack, 
once you remove the probe, the, even if you're having light pressure on the probe, which is what you should do, uh, the, the flesh will still move somewhat and you may get some relative movement of the needle tip and lose your positioning. So I like to actually put the angiocath in the vessel. So I have my ultrasound here and I'll I also just like to confirm that things are moving smoothly. Just be careful you don't shear the tip of the catheter off. And then you would you have your ultrasound probe, access your vessel. Once you got your flash, you would then advance, drop your angle slightly, advance the vessel completely, or advance the catheter completely into the vessel. And then be ready to get your thumb over the tip of the catheter. So immediately I have my thumb over the tip of the catheter. Then I could set my needle aside and insert my guide wire in the usual fashion, etc. Yes, that's a nice technique because you know that once a catheter is in the vessel, it's not coming out of there. You can go get your wire, you can relax. It's not going to be moving around like you would with a needle. So it's a much nicer technique in that way. I agree. So roadblock number two, you've gotten flashback, but you can't advance your wire. We talked about if you're going to use the big steel needle, ways you can troubleshoot that. It, if that's not working for you, go ahead and try the angiocath. Okay, so roadblock number three, you've gotten flashback, and you, you're pumped, you got flashback, you're in a vessel, but the blood looks a little bit too red than you'd like, and maybe you know, it didn't paint a wall, but it was a little more pressure than you would have expected. So you're wondering, am I in an artery or a vein? So we've all had that, it's very stressful. Jamie, break it down, how would you approach that? Well, that's a great problem to, uh, to address, Mike. There's, there's a few solutions to that, and actually that's one reason why I like using the angiocath, mm -hmm. because that gives you right away a roadmap for dealing with that problem. So. In this case, let's just imagine you're in the vessel and with your straight needle, we'll insert the wire. Yeah, there's no harm in putting the wire in an artery if you're yeah. in an artery, so go ahead and put your wire so in. We'll yep. just insert the wire deeply, just uh, have somebody watch the cardiac monitor. And then we can do an angiocath over the wire. So just careful of your needle. Your angiocath can go over the wire. And this is really you know, if this gets done to an artery accidentally, it's not injurious. So that's the advantage. So if you just gently feed that in, then I'll reload my, my wire onto my loop. I have my thumb ready here to get over the vessel, get over the catheter rather. Now I can see if I'm uh, in the vessel. So. You could put a cap or not. I'll put a cap. That way I don't have to worry about air embolism, anything like that. I can take my time. Now I can connect a piece of extension tubing, which I've just cut short to fit. And that'll allow me to check the CVP. So just be careful. If the patient has very low CVP, then uh, you could actually, and you're up high, you can introduce air. So start low, for, look for the column of blood and then start to raise it. And then as you raise it, if your column of blood comes down to say, let's say here, then you know, you know your CP is, CVP is say 12 centimeters. And then it may have some slight respirophasic pulsatility, but it won't be pulsatile like, in an, arti like an artery. If it's jetting up, you know, up to here, you obviously know you're in an artery, and then you could stop and you know, start over basically. Yeah. The other th option is, take that off. Now we're secure. There's no danger to the patient at this point. You're in an artery or a vein. You could draw off a, a sample, send it for a blood gas. Is it a venous or arterial sample? That's the other thing you could do. My only caveat is if you're in a subclavian, sometimes the subclavian vein can be pulsatile enough from the subclavian artery pushing on it that it can fool you into thinking you're in the artery. Mm -hmm. That's actually a great case where, uh, to send off a blood gas to tell the difference. Fair enough. All right, so yeah, so it seems like we want to let the blood flow about 20 centimeters and then lift it up. If it, go, if it starts falling down to the patient, you know you're probably in the, you know you're in the vein, but if it still is rising up, then you know you're in the artery. Yeah, just be careful. There are the odd patients in severe heart failure with CVPs of 30 or 40 yeah. or so. You can sometimes be fooled, Fair but... Um, okay, one thing I'll say is if you don't have a nurse available to get your IV tubing and you're sterile, you don't feel like you have the time to, to uh, send off an uh, ABG and a VBG, to, to figure out where you are. What you can do, if you're really in a crunch, the, the sheath that the wire comes in can actually be taken apart 
And you can actually, it fits very nicely in the catheter itself. Again, put the thumb on to prevent air embolism. Put the catheter, put the sheath in the catheter. Again, hold it down to air. Blood will flow the same way, and you lift it up. And you know, again, if it's, if it's coming out the top, you're in the artery. If it's falling back towards the patient, again, eight, nine uh, uh, centimeters of water, you know you're, you're in the vein. So that way, you don't have to ask for IV tubing. You don't have to send a blood, glass, a blood gas. And that way, nobody knows you even question your line place in the first place. And you might say, well, thanks, Michael. Now you've destroyed my sheath. How am I going to choose the wire with the J-tip? Actually, the wire has a, uh, last, uh, a spring in it such that if you pull on the wire, the J-tip will straighten. And so if you are going to, if, you're, if you're, for whatever reason your sheath has been lost or uh, <laughs> damaged, then if you just pull longitudinally on the wire, you get rid of the J-tip and you can still pass the wire in the catheter easily. Okay, so roadblock number three, you got flashback. Are you in the artery or the vein? There's a myriad of ways you can troubleshoot that. I would think be familiar with a few of them. The use of IV tubing just to make sure, that make sure your pressure is in the vein is probably the most practical way, but sometimes it's not always definitive, in which case you might have sent a blood gas. But uh, just be familiar with a few ways you can troubleshoot that because that's often, that's not an uncommon scenario. Don't forget, ultrasound is your friend. You can look with the ultrasound directly and see where the wire is. So last roadblock, roadblock number four the dreaded kinked wire. Now it seems to me most of these are happening at that time of dilation, is that true? Yeah, that seems to be my experience as well. All right, so a few things to consider. So now your wire is in the vessel, you're gonna make your cut. I find a lot of people don't make as generous a cut as they should because if, it, if your cut isn't as big enough, you're gonna dilate, you put more pressure than you want to and that's how you get in trouble with kinking your wire. So if you're gonna make your cut, Make sure, first of all, make sure you hold the, the, uh, the wire in line with, uh, with, its, with its axis into the skin. Your scalpel will be parallel to the wire and you want to advance your scalpel along the wire and advance it a good, a good centimeter. Next thing you want to do is make sure that, that the cut you made is communicating with the path of the wire because otherwise you're no further ahead. Next thing I find, when you're putting the dilator on, first of all, here's a, something to help you, help you. I find that a lot of people when they're, they're a bit nervous and they're putting a central line in, they're, they're shaking, put both your hands down and uh, make sure you're um, secure to the patient, do not float it in space, make it a lot easier to put any uh, the catheter or the dilator over the wire. When you're advancing the dilator, you really want to make sure your left hand is not moving. It's holding that wire taut as your right hand is advancing the dilator into the vessel. If you're running into resistance, you can put a little more, little more pressure, but make sure your left hand is stable. You can even sometimes do a kind of a screw or a, a twisting maneuver to try to break up that tissue. But the answer is not to get in this kind of plunging, uh, plunging of the vessel. When you're doing that, that's when you get into problems with kinking your wire and damaging the posterior wall of the vessel. If you look here, that dilator, it is stiff, but it will negotiate any turn you ask it to as long as you're holding that wire sturdy with your left hand. When you get into trouble is when that left hand is not holding the wire, you're advancing your catheter, or, you're, or worst case scenario, you're pushing with both your hands. That's when you get into a problem with that dilator, kinking the wire and damaging the posterior wall of the vessel. Keep in mind also the anatomy that you looked at when you were using your ultrasound, and it told you very clearly, visually, how far away the IJ was from the surface of the, of the skin. So that tells you your margin of safety Correct. with your scalpel. And in some people, the IJ is very superficial and you know, stabbing down a centimeter will get you into the IJ. And if they have heart failure in a high pressure venous system, they can bleed profusely. So just let their, your ultrasound inform your uh, use of the scalpel. And on some people, it's no problem, insert the scalpel all the way. Other people, it might just be a small nick along the skin, just like Mike was showing. Uh, so just remember to you know, use your ultrasound technique to, to its fullest. For sure, roadblock number four, avoiding the kinked wire. Make a measured but generous cut. And definitely be careful with the movement of your hands when advancing the dilator to avoid tissue damage and kinking of your wire. So Mike, that was great. Let's uh, run through some of the roadblocks that we addressed so that we can uh, review. Sounds good. Roadblock one is just optimizing patient positioning to minimize the chance of a carotid puncture. And always consider uh, a new approach, such as the posterior approach. Roadblock number two, you've gotten flashback, but you can't pass your wire. If you're going to use the big steel needle, we talked about some techniques you can use to make that a little bit easier, or consider trying using the angiocath. Roadblock three, um, not being sure if you're inadvertently in an artery and using the 
and uh, using the uh, piece of venous tubing, or uh, sorry, of uh, IV tubing to see if it's pulsatile or if there's a CVP that you can measure and confirm that you're in the vein. If that's not available, you can disassemble the uh, retaining hoop from the central line kit and use that. And lastly, roadblock number four is about avoiding that dreaded kinked wire. Just being very intentional about making your cut with a scalpel and also be very intentional with your advancement of the dilator over the, over the wire to prevent vessel injury and kinking of the wire. So that's it, I think it summarizes it pretty good. Thanks Mike, I think that takes care of those roadblocks yeah. and ensures that everybody can drive safe next time and have fun doing your next central line. Absolutely.